Okay, so hello everyone. So for today, we will be talking about uh, foreign direct investments and like how it looks like for blockchain gaming economies. So the flow of today's presentation will be, first we will be talking about what FDIs are or foreign direct investments are. And we'll look at the short-term impacts on regional economies. So this is more based on literature that we've researched. And we'll also look at long-term risks of FDI dependence, so an over-reliance um, on foreign direct investments for these regional economies, again, based on academic literature that has been written. Then we will talk about what these would look like or what FDI would look like for blockchain gaming economies before we check its impact on these gaming economies. Then lastly, we'll try to show what protocol should keep in mind when creating or when building their projects in terms of FDI. So to start, so what is FDI? FDI is basically a cross-border transfer of funds made by a foreign entity to a domestic economy of interest. So these are people from a foreign country A who would like to invest in the domestic economy of a different country B. So it's an influx of capital from, again, the foreign source to be invested in the domestic economy, particularly to develop a sector, a specific economic sector within that domestic economy. So it could be in the forms of infrastructure building in developing countries, like creating bridges, creating roads, creating highways, or it could be in the form of large multinational firms who are who want to enter the domestic market in order to um, facilitate competition inside that market. So what are the short-term impacts of FDIs to countries or regional economies? So first, one, first off, it, it creates jobs, basically. So FDI, as a result of influx of capital in the domestic economy, creates jobs and that these jobs actually serve as an income source for the domestic workers and these domestic workers can use that income in order to consume goods inside the economy thus creating economic activity inside the domestic economy so for example if a multinational firm enters a domestic market then it would need your it would need some accountants it would need an hr it would need people to man their operations and each of these roles of course would have salaries, would have to be filled by people of coming from the domestic economy. And these multinational firms would then have to provide salaries for these people. And the people would use these salaries in order to consume goods with, within the economy. So it also it's a good way also to increase unemployment inside the domestic economy, which will further strengthen that economy or the benefic benefiting economy. Next, it also increases productivity. And it increases productivity in a way at an industry level for the domestic economy, mainly because of a, a phenomenon called the spill, spillover effect, which means that the investing, the foreign investor would bring technology from their country of, all over to the recipient domestic economy and they will teach the domestic workers or the domestic market how to use these strategies how to use these best practices how to use these this technology and this will in turn help the domestic economy learn from that new that new technology that new processes and hopefully build on that in the future so basically it's up uh, facilitates the transfer of knowledge from one country a more developed economy to another and uh, next it also promotes competition within the domestic market so if there is a foreign a multinational company that enters the domestic market of course um it would there are already domestic players in that specific market so in order to stay competitive they need to increase their production they they need to increase their productivity in order to compete with that new multinational firm which in theory should really benefit the whole eco the, eco the economy as a whole next because goods and services produced by these glo by these um foreign investors have a global market, it paves the way for the domestic economy to start exporting whatever goods and services that foreign entity starts to build inside the economy. So this could be in terms of manufacturing, in terms of skilled manpower that's being developed, and it could be in terms of a lot of different aspects of depending on which economy the investor comes into. So these are three 
short-term impacts on regional economies. However, there is still growing literature that in the long term, FDI dependence on foreign direct investment actually is harmful to the economy. So it's really up for debate. And it's there's it's a back and forth kind of discussion between academics on if it's if FDI really helps or is harmful in the economy. But in the long run, based on the literature that we've read, basically the long-term risks of dependence of FDI include inorganic growth of the domestic economy. And what does that mean? Mainly because there is a foreign influence in the domestic economy because foreign entities are, in essence, transferring capital over to the domestic economy. That domestic economy is influenced by that foreign entity's interest or it could also influence influence the politics within that domestic region so it, it becomes there is this principal agent problem where the whoever is governing the domestic economy or the ruling el- elite might have interest to prioritize the foreign entities or the foreign multinational companies that enter the domestic market over the the interests of the the domestic market itself. So this could be in the forms of unfair competitive advantages, like less tax compared to the domestic producers, or it could be in the form of favorable policies, favorable laws to help facilitate competitive advantages for the foreign entity. So next, foreign investors basically export profits, resources, and manpower from the domestic economy. And Basically, because these are investors, right? They need to make a return on their investment. They could actually, once they establish that their company, once they've established their project, they would need to extract income or basically profit from that project. And when they do, they won't use that income or that gains inside the domestic economy. The main beneficiary of this would be the foreign country where that that entity is located and it's not just in terms of profits or currencies it can be in terms of scarce resources inside the domestic economy or it can be in terms of skilled manpower because they hire like i mentioned earlier they hire workers inside the domestic economy those that are skilled enough could actually be relocated to any to the foreign country itself leaving that domestic economy w- with one less skilled worker, right? So in terms of another long-term risk is basically uh, the crowding out of domestic investors. So this would have it would be in line with the inorganic growth in the sense that um, because of unfair, not really unfair, but then significant benefits that foreign that attract foreign investors, make it cheaper for foreign firms to enter the market than domestic firms to compete in. It. In it, so if it's more beneficial for foreign firms to basically compete in that market, it might it will market share from the domestic firms, and it eventually would also might also lead to some of those, especially the smaller domestic firms, to just leave the market all in all together. And lastly, there's also argument that knowledge spillovers doesn't occur, especially in developing countries, mainly because it can only be achieved if. Uh, domestic firms adopt that foreign technology and it might it's hard for domestic firms to do that because one foreign investors protect their technology from being copied mainly through patents and to, to retain that competitive advantage and two the, the sometimes the current domestic technology is actually lagging and is far behind in the, to a point that the domestic market can actually use that foreign tech so it's really it doesn't really facilitate the transfer of knowledge inside developed economies and that's a critique and a long-term risk for of dependence of fdis so what does this look like for blockchain gaming economies so in terms of the domestic economy for blockchain games basically those the Protocol them, the protocols themselves are the domestic economies because they are the recipient of the funds that are transferred. And this is also where value is created. So this is the marketplace. This is where everything happens. The transactions happen. The value creation happens. So this is, so basically the protocols are the domestic economies. So 
if they're the domestic economies, who are the foreign entities? So the foreign entities are your venture capitalists, your yield guilds, the individual gamers that um, provide the capital to fund the development of blockchain gaming economies. So these are the ones who purchase your NFTs, your tokens, and basically play the game and add value to the game. But they're considered foreign entities because they're not part of that blockchain gaming economy. There's someone external from that ecosystem who wants to enter in order to build something to get a return from it. So in that sense, what does FDI look like? So FDI and blockchain gaming economies basically are the value brought by these VCs, this, these guilds, and these gamers through the purchase of like private and public sales, NFT offerings, or even through just purchasing assets off, the, off of their marketplace, mainly to interact, again, to interact with the local economy, which is the gaming protocols, to cre- and to create value inside that economy. So the impacts of blockchain gaming can also be segregated in terms of short run and short term and long term impacts. So in the short term, these foreign these foreign entities or the, the VCs, the guilds, and the gamers actually help still help create jobs. And the jobs here are in the form of the profit sharing scholarship programs that um, are established inside these game economies. And also, it also helps create jobs for the development team. As they look to grow, they look to onboard more people in order to help manage, help develop their game, which also spurs development inside that economy. Next, it still it also increases productivity inside that ecosystem. How? So it increases productivity by the sharing of best practices in order to maximize earnings inside the economy. So these are where your creators come in. They go in, play the game, they create content that they would say, hey, this is the best build, this is the best um, strategy in order to win in this particular match or this particular level. So once they create that content, it helps others to, who, who want to enter the game to, re, to who, do, who does the research first prior to entering and it, it would say, oh, okay, this is what I would play, this is how I would do it. It facilitates and helps users on board easier thus increasing productivity inside the ecosystem. And lastly, it also increased exports. And exports in in the blockchain gaming space, at least, based on our research, is more of value entering inside the economy. And that value is in terms of people entering that economy. So more players enter the economy, mainly because they hear that, oh, okay, I could earn from playing a game. And it's easy to enter this economy because there's a lot of content already available to help me transition and join this this ecosystem, right? But in terms of the long term, there is still a risk of an overdependence of these kind of income source or FDI capital source rather. So in the long term, again, one problem that we foresee is basically the principal agent problem. Again, here, um, interests of like larger investors, meaning your VCs, your whales, or large guilds might take priority over the general community. And mainly because this is these entities have a large stake or are really large stakeholders inside the economy. And the development team might feel pressure to make sure that their needs are, are met over the needs of the general economy or the general community rather. So this could also be in the form of maybe if they form a DAO or a decentralized autonomous organization and that DAO is mainly governed by the stakes inside the economy. Therefore, only the large elite will really benefit from that kind of ecosystem. So basically, the decision makers aren't really re- representative of the entire economy and would, would just or might just prioritize the interests of a select few large stakeholders. So in terms of the long term, another long term risk that we see is in terms of value extraction. So basically because players look to extract value in order to make a return from their investment, so they would look to extract that utility token earnings or any earnings from play from interacting with the ecosystem from that from this domestic economy. So it's a minor these are where your minor personas come in when you create a game. So it's just more of, it's basically an unsustainable ecosystem and a problem that 
developers would really have to address. Next, it also crowds out gamers, mainly through high barriers to entry or poor competition environment that prevent ga- gamers from entering the economy or would cause them to lose the con- uh, to leave the economy instead. So first, for example, if there's a lot of interest in the blockchain game, th- that blockchain game, NFT prices might soar because of the high demand. And this might cause other players who want, who are, could, could be beneficial to the economy because they really like the game or they really want to play the game to not enter because of funds, right? Also, when there is poor com- competitive environment inside the economy, mainly because of the in that th- that the interests of larger investors are prioritized over the general community, then gamers who would provide value inside the economy who would really stick who are sticking because of the game would just choose to leave it because they are treated poorly inside to represent that that knowledge spill over mainly some members of the economy just who focus especially those who just focus on that value extraction might not be able to understand the bigger picture of the blockchain game or the blockchain gaming economy they might not understand technology behind it or basically they won't they don't they just focus on what's in it for me what i could extract from the economy and when that well dries up basically they cause they would cause um fud so fear uncertainty and doubt and talk negatively about that blockchain gaming economy which of course it, from the, would cause um a negative market impact or negative perception in the market for prospective players or en- market entrants. And overall, basically, it, there is growing academic literature or there's academic literature that says that o- an over-reliance on FDI basically slows economic growth. Yeah, so there's growing academic literature that says that um, FDI, FDI dependence exhibits slow economic growth. So what should protocols keep in mind? when building their game in terms of FDI. So they should all FDI is an important aspect of the got of the gaming pro of the economy that the gaming the gaming projects are building, especially at the start. So why is that? Because one, it helps create jobs inside the gaming economies. It helps and these jobs um become earning potential that help attract new players inside the economy and help the economy grow as a whole, right? But it's not just that. Mainly, protocols should also keep in mind that yes, there are short-term benefits for having FDI in or attracting foreign direct investments inside your economy, but there are also long-term risks associated with that as well, especially if your economy is dependent on that. And one big example of that is depending on user influx to facilitate as a, to facilitate the growth inside your blockchain game. So. Possible ways to mitigate this is basically create an economy that is not dependent on FDI. But how do you do that? That's the main question, right? So basically, you try to, to convert your investors from foreign to domestic. So basically, you want them to stay inside the economy as long as possible. Yes, there is still a chance to for them to exit with given that even if you, you do your best to please these um, market players, but then it's still best efforts on trying to retain that value inside the economy. So basically, projects need to have a way to promote value retention. And this could be in the form of these market mechanisms or game design mechanisms that help reinvest whatever earnings you have inside the economy to help facilitate a better gaming experience. And next, developers should focus on building a game that the community will love, mainly so they would stick around for a longer period of time instead of just treating the entire ecosystem as an investment. This could also be in the f- form of utility token or NFT buybacks through through revenue streams or additional revenue streams like ads or additional sales made by the protocol in order to help facilitate a demand for these tokens and it these tokens will won't just depreciate in value. Next, of course, um projects should always put the community ahead. So they should cater to the community. They should be able to educate, they should be transparent, they should communicate with their economy and the DAOs or the the mechanisms that you place in terms of building a DAO should not be exploitable by large market players. And lastly, of course, 
protocol should make sure that whoever they partner with, be it VCs or guilds, should have the same interest as the team for the long term. So they should be aligned in order for um less in order to facilitate better growth and less to cause less friction while the project is growing. So with that, these are the different findings that we have comparing FDI to of your regional economies to blockchain gaming protocols. So with that, I would open the floor if you have any questions. So I think one of the most important things is this part of creating jobs. So if you go back to the slide where we talk about short-term benefits of FDIs, yeah, there's three things. At the end of the day, creating jobs, increasing productivity, and increased exports, they all need to focus on one key thing, which is creating value. Because a VC or FDI could come in to create a lot of jobs, to create, to increase productivity and to increase exports only to extract value and leave the system. So that could be something like you have in a game, let's say XE, and FDI could be someone having a lot of XEs, a lot of these creatures to allow people to use the creatures to go for battles. That is creating jobs. But how does it help in the long-term goal? How does it help with the overall picture? And how do we turn this short-term investment, if you can call it, into long-term value generation for the system as a whole, that is key. If you just go in to extract value, you're not going to add a lot of value. And we can, do, we can use this analogy in a lot of these real-world economies and real-world countries, where you have countries investing in other countries, just creating jobs for their own people, or it could be colonizers going into, like the Dutch colonizers going to Indonesia in the past, extracted all the spices, minerals, and things from underground, send it back, which is increasing export, send it back to the Netherlands, creating jobs for the locals to, to extract all of this, increasing productivity. You know, people, instead of, I don't know, sitting at home doing nothing, you're actually doing something and helping GDP. But this is all short term, right? This is not true FDI. Mm. And people think of FDI, think of VCs, or think of you know, a big chunk of money coming in as something good. That is great. But the key thing as an economist or as a person designing the ecosystem is how do we transfer this short-term wealth generation or wealth, wealth endowment into a long-term value creation to make sure that the economy is sustainable. And that is key. That is why we, don't ha we have a lot of problems in the long run because we're just relying on an FDI mm. just to do these creating job, increasing productivity and increasing exports for the short run, but all for the FDI, like all for the VCs or all for these value extractors. So how do we transfer that to value creation? That will be important. And how does that look like? Well, there's no silver answer. That <laughs> it really depends on the kind of systems you're talking about, right? Yep. And I think the key thing here, especially for blockchain gaming economies, is that what does a domestic market look like? Because these are protocols. Of course, these aren't countries where there are already residents inside, right? So in my head, when I think about domestic economies, you need to convert foreigners. Basically, you need to attract foreign residents, right? So if you have a declining population, you would, like for example, Japan. Japan would really need um, the help of foreign workers to help spur the economic activity inside their ecosystem, right? So in that same way, um, for gaming protocols, when they build the game, they would need players, right? In, in order to survive or basically in order to thrive in their economy. So you need to convert players from an investor mindset because of the earning like the earning capacity or the earning potential of these games would attract players or investors inside the game but then you need to convert them from investors to players they need you need to convert them you need them to stay inside the economy and continue these activities in order to produce value but then that value needs to be funneled back in to the economy 100% agree great so it's it's important that we look at this as you know we look at VCs not just as a value extractor but also how can VCs be creating a lot of value from a GDP perspective which helps us to design the right kind of mechanisms for the ecosystem. Super. <laughs>